It is live! Welcome everyone, my name is Brian. Um, this is the session for, um, we get asking questions to Benny Lewis, and he's going to answer all our burning questions for the At One Challengers. So thank you for being with us, Benny. My pleasure. I always like to uh, help out the, the At One people. <laughs> the Ad One people. You guys are there. Yeah. We are the Ad One people. <laughs> All right. So why don't we go right ahead? Because we only have 30 minutes. So I just want to get as many questions in as possible. So who wants to go first? Actually, I need a new people. <laughs> yeah, you can use the chat feature to see. Or I think you, if you want, there are questions people had that uh, I saw on the Facebook group. And I could start with them. Um, yes. And then we can go into live questions people might have. Okay, cool. Okay, let me let me just start with the first one. Um, this is from this uh, you you you're, how are you learning? Can you hear me? You you you're connecting there, Brian. Could you say that again? Okay. This question is from Alex. And he asked, do you have any advice on how to use the association method? Can you give us some example when you're learning Chinese? How do you use association method? Um, OK, I presume he, he means uh, association for mnemonics. Um, and there's loads of great examples. Uh, you can hear me OK, yeah? Yes. There's loads of, loads of great examples on memrise.com. <laughs> but since he wants an example with uh, Chinese, there's yes. uh, one that I, I used that um, helped me a lot because when I was speaking Mandarin, yeah. uh, I would tell people very often that I have a goal or I have a target to mm -hmm. reach level B1 or B2 in three months. And so the word target was a word I wanted to use very often. Now, the word target in Mandarin is uh, mu biao. And that doesn't sound like target or goal or anything like in English. So I came up with um, uh, a linked association in my mind for that whole thing. So the story I came up with, and you would find many examples of stories like this on Memrise. Uh, I like to come up with them whenever I can. Was I imagined that I'm walking through a field and a cow falls from the sky. And he just falls all the way down and lands right in front of me. And conveniently, he has a bullseye painted on his, uh, on her, I should say, rear end. Now, I'm actually out in this field because I'm looking for target practice. And I happen to have a bow and arrow made out of bees. So I pull my bow and arrow back. I kind of kneel down a little bit. So I'm aiming exactly at the cow's ass. I let go. The bees go to the ass, and then uh, I, I shoot my target, and the cow goes, ow! So in that very, very ridiculous story, if you can uh, remember that, I actually have everything I need for this mnemonic. So I have the uh, mu, which is a fourth tone, a falling tone. So the mu sound of a cow is the association. So I have the cow falling. And when I was learning Mandarin, any time... I may I, a lot. There are many ways to do it. People do the associate through colors. Uh, you might have like blue for first tone or whatever. For me, I actually visually represented what I wanted to be doing that action. The rising tone, it was going up. Uh, the level tone, it was staying level. The uh, or sorry, the rising tone, I should say, it was bouncing, um, and so on. Yeah. So I I have a falling tone with the sound mu, and that's mu. And then for the second part, I have biao, and that's why I have a, um, a bow and arrow made of bees, which I pull back, shoot at the cow, and the cow goes, ow. <laughs> and, and then the way I remember that it's a level tone is because I kneel down, and I shoot the bow and arrow so that the bow goes straight. And that's how it's biao and not biao or biao. So then I have mu biao, and then the whole point is I the cow had a target on its ass, so that's the target. So that's ah. just one example, and that's how I came up with. Uh, and you can do this for many different things. 
Yeah. Uh, like I said, memrise.com is fantastic because it will create these for you. I made I made, made this one up myself, um, and it's it's very effective for me because I I don't I don't need to think of this association. When I speak Mandarin, I just say Mu Biao, and I don't I don't think oh what was the cow doing or anything. It's just you you need the association to remember it the first couple of times, and then it's just part of you. Cool. All right, so let's take the next question. Um, I don't know how to unmute you guys. Do you can you do you need to unmute yourself or how does it work? Um, the we can unmute yourself. ourselves. Oh, you we can, can unmute. Okay, yourself. good. Okay, so okay, great. Let's take a quick, quick question from you guys. Who wants to ask a question? I guess Come I'll on, go ahead since my uh, All right. microphone's you unmuted. Yourself. Um, my first question is, at what point did you realize that you could make a career out of uh, your language learning um, adventures? Um, I did not plan to make a career out of it for until very, very late. Because I had, uh, I mean, technically I made a career out of using my languages when I became a freelance translator. And that allowed me to travel. So that's something to keep in mind. You can you can combine, in my case, engineering with languages, and the two together came to me to be translating engineering documents. There was a huge demand for that, and I could travel many years from that. But uh, I think you're probably referring to the fact that I made a career out of learning languages through the blog. Right. Um, so when I registered Fluent in three months, I actually had no intention whatsoever to monetize it. I just genuinely wanted to share my adventures and encourage people and I imagined that monetizing a blog would require lots of spammy advertisements and I didn't I did not want to do that I don't like spammy websites and I use adblock plus in my um, browsers so I kind of feel that's that's not a a, a great long-term thing because a lot of people use that but I was in Thailand a few months after I registered the blog and I met a bunch of very interesting bloggers who are now very good friends of mine and they gave me other ideas and they said I I can't write an ebook that I self-publish and that I can earn from. I can create a digital course, a video-based course. Um, I can do consultation. I can do coaching. I can do all of these things. And I initially, my plan was to do that part time and continue translating. And I figured if I did it part time, I'd get a little financial boost. But it turned out that the whole year I'd been blogging before I decided to. Uh, sell my first thing on the blog. I had grown such a strong audience uh, just by focusing on what they wanted, by sharing a positive language advice, that the audience was already built to be strong enough that that could support me. And even though my plan was not just to earn a living from the blog, when I made the transition, I actually was making enough that I could quit my job as a translator. Uh, so I did not plan for that over the long term. It just happened. Um, I found there are lots of people who try to make a living from their blog and they try so hard that it doesn't really work. But in my case, the focus has always been uh, encouraging people. Like you'll see all my YouTube videos that go up there, they're not advert anything. I'm not, I don't have any sponsored blog posts. So it's like 99.999% of what I do is free. And that's why when I do something, the 0.001%, then I've already established an audience that that helps support itself. So it's it's a very strange concept that a lot of people would like to get into it, but you have to make, especially on the internet, you have to focus on making free things. That's why I, uh, you know, like the Skype Me Maybe video that um, people really enjoyed, I did not make a cent from that. That actually costed me a lot of money because I had to hire a video editor. I uh, cost me I I'm breaking up a little bit. Okay. Oh, Fluent in Three Months Premium is a special offer, and then that little boost would actually give me a lot of um, a lot of revenue. So it's it's <coughs> uh, it's not been a long-term plan, but I stumbled into it, and I decided to maintain what I'd stumbled into, which is focus on free content and only do a little pitch once or twice a year and just like 
you know, people eventually they, cool. people look around my site and they see I have a premium product, but most people stick to the free content. Awesome. All right, <laughs> okay. guys, let's, let's let's stick to the language learning questions, okay? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Who's next? Hello. Who wants to volunteer? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question is: um, Do you ever have a, a situation where, because uh, I, I speak Spanish already, and I'm learning Russian, so I feel like I constantly, when I'm on the, um, when I'm on Skype with someone in Russian, I constantly want to go back. I find myself accidentally saying things in Spanish. Since you speak so many languages, do you ever have that? Problem? Oh, sorry, I'll go on. I'll go on. Right now. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I, okay, I, I think I understood. So you are working at um, where and you're, you're taking Benny. Yes, I do indeed. Can you hear me okay, Brian? Uh, can you hear me okay, yeah. Brian? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, all right. Yes, uh, yes, so, yes. for instance, when I was learning a uh, little Japanese, I kept coming back to saying uh, Mandarin words, um, and it's it's weird because I have a, a weird kind of uh, association since I have so many languages. It's never the same language. It's just something that happens to have something in common. So you know, I'm in Asia, so I, or I'm learning something with the same kind of characters. So that association was there. But when I was learning Hungarian, very strangely enough, I kept wanting to say Irish words. Um, and I don't really know why, but they kept kind of coming out. And it's not something necessarily that you can just stop from happening. Uh, you just have to keep consistently practice until it goes away. The good news is the reverse isn't true. When you speak a language very well, at least at the B1, ideally at the B2 level, um, and then when you get into the C levels, you're not going to, like my Spanish, I'm not going to start saying words in... Uh, I don't know, Mandarin or Italian or something, because my Spanish is very, very good. I've got it to that level. I've maintained it. I've practiced it. I've gotten professional certifications, so I don't have to worry. But when my level is very low, when it's A1 or A2, then hmm. there will be lots of little kind of uh, fluctuations. And all I could do is try try to remember. Uh, one way that I, I do the... Uh, I try to separate things is I try to create a external persona when I'm speaking a language. So I try to have a body language with that culture and that helps me not, uh, that helps me like compartmentalize them a little bit better. So I try to speak, I tried to speak with a Japanese voice rather than a Mandarin voice and that helped me remember that I'm not going to be using the tones or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I did indeed throw in lots of words in many languages I've learned and it's just lots of practice and you speak to somebody and they're like what, what's that word you just said? I'm like oh sorry uh, I wanted to say this word instead so you will you'll just you'll make this the mistake and it's something I always tell people all the time mistakes happen and just through practice you'll make less and less of them uh, be open to getting corrections don't worry about it uh, it's not the end of the world if you mix one language up with, with another um, as long as you learn from it great Great question. Okay, who's next? I can go. Okay, go ahead. Now. Um, I was looking for some advice on maintaining languages um, because I find that the more I focus on the new language, the harder it is to remember what I've learned on the ones that um, I do have at a higher level. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm cheating myself if I spend too much time trying to maintain the others. So how do you find that balance? Yeah, for me, there is no balance. It's one or the other. So that's why I am either in full-on three-month mode. I'm learning a new... And this is why I have a three-month deadline, because it's both short enough and long enough that I can make significant progress in one language, but it's still short enough that I can get back to my other languages. So uh, like one pe people might suggest, oh, does that mean you can learn four languages a year? Definitely not because I need to spend three months on one language and then spend ideally the whole rest of the year improving my other languages. 
So when I'm in a three-month project, I just accept it's going to happen that my level in all my other languages are going to go down a little bit. You know, best languages will go down very slightly, just I'll get slightly rusty, but then the B1 or B2 languages will, will kind of really slow down and I'll, I'll need some momentum when I get back into them. And that's fine, I accept for three months that's going to happen, but then after that I'm in 100% maintenance and improving mode for the languages I already know. I, I feel it's, uh, I mean, there are people who can learn one language while maintaining others, but for me I can't spread my focus very well. I need to do one thing and do it well. So I would say focus on just one language for a certain number of months. Get that up a notch, up, up a Cephalor level or two, and then uh, hold on to it and maintain that while you're maintaining other ones. Because like now, for instance, I'm not learning a new language. Uh, what I'm doing uh, is I'm trying to make all the time I can, despite traveling every day, to hop on Skype and practice Mandarin, to practice French, to practice every language, no matter what level I have it at, uh, to either use it on Skype or to read it, and uh, that, yeah, I, I'll alternate between the, the various different languages I know, and then when I get on to my next language, whenever that will be and whatever it will be, I will not be maintaining because that's too much to do at the same time. And I feel like I'm not going to make serious progress in the new language unless I give it my 100% focus. But like I said, you just have to accept that your other languages will diminish. And this is why I, is one of the, the, the main reasons that I like three months enough of time, significant progress in one language, but still not that bad that you can afterwards get back into maintenance mode. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, great. Let's take a question from um, from the Facebook group. Okay, this question is from David. Do you ever find yourself getting bored in the middle of learning a new language? And if so, what do you do to combat the boredom? Yeah, definitely uh, b both boredom and plateaus uh, in terms of getting stuck at the level. That will happen a lot in every language project. It's happened in pretty much all of my projects. And the reason that happens is because what you're doing is not good enough. So uh, one presumption people make is that I'm not a good enough language learner. I, I'm not interested in this topic or I'm stupid. But I would say if, I, if you're getting bored, it's because what you're doing is boring. It's very simply, you know. And so um, uh, if I'm like stuck on grammar and learning conjugations and, um, you know, word case, cases from, on nouns and so on, and I'm getting really, really bored with that. that. That's a necessary evil. It's something you have to do, but I would not devote the whole day to that. I would do that a little bit and then get back to reading comic books or watching a silly soap opera or trying to have a Skype conversation. I, I, I would never get bored with a Skype conversation. That's why that's the core of my language mm. learning. But I, I realize that's not the same for everybody. Either. Some other people may find speech interesting. So, and ultimately, if you're if you're studying grammar, let's say as an example, uh, if you're studying grammar, that can get very boring because that's not natural use of a language. You do not in your native language. You do not in English, on a, a rainy Sunday afternoon, think uh, you know I got nothing to do. I'm going to study some past participles in English for a while. People don't do that. You know, people mm -hmm. will play a game or they'll do they'll do something, and that's what you have to realize in your in your target language. There are things you have have to do you have to eventually absorb the grammar rules. I personally think that should wait till later so that you uh, have more of a chance to, to enjoy the language. But I I say if you're bored, mix it up a bit. Don't don't keep doing the same thing, you know. Uh, someone once said the usually attributed to Einstein that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results. So I say change what you're doing. Cool. Awesome. Okay, let's take a question from the audience here. Courtney? Hey. Or Chris? Okay. How are you doing, Chris? Okay. Hey, Benny. Uh, nice to see you and Brian in Berlin, by the way. Yeah. Um, my question is very simple because I'm, I've, I think I've reached a level in Russian now where I'm looking to take on some tutoring to reach a higher conversational fluency. I just wanted to know what kind of things you're looking for when you're looking to find a, a tutor for you. 
Uh, which level would you say you're at, more or less, on the scepter scale? Uh, that would be like A2 at, at most. Okay. Uh, generally, what I would do is in the A1, A2 level, I look for. Uh, look, firstly, I would I would actually book a session with all teachers that look interesting. So any language. When I started Mandarin, when I started Japanese, and when I started Arabic. I actually tested out almost every single teacher in Italki for a whole week and a half. I would switch between each one. And this meant that I could eliminate, I mean, I just got it out of the way. I just found what's the best teacher for me. And in the A-levels, the best teacher generally is a patient teacher who I feel is, do, is helping me do most of the talking. The last thing I want is to go on Skype and spend a whole hour just uh, hearing someone else talk to me. I mean, it, it, it's less pressure on me, but I'm not necessarily learning something. So I would find a teacher who, rather than, because some teachers, they might be like, OK, so what do you want to talk about? And I, I hate that question, because I feel it's too much pressure on me, because I am I have enough things to think about that I'm just trying to communicate in the language. So I like to find a teacher who is good at keeping the conversation flowing, because at the A1, A2 level, I'm not likely to be super talkative. I'm going to try and say, you know, oh, they'll say, oh, do you like chocolate? And I'll say, yes. Then I'd, there, I'd like them to, to ask a follow-up question. Say, oh, OK. What kind of chocolate do you like? Or, or you know, do something rather than just say, oh, OK, uh, that's nice. You know, you, you need someone who is good at kind of helping the conversation to flow. Um, it ten depends on your personality. Like, you know, I like that at the start. I do not like someone who is very strict on grammar and correcting every mistake. I would like a teacher like that at the level B1 and B2. That's that's when I like to wring out my grammar mistakes. Mm -hmm. But at A1, A2, I just want somebody who I feel I can start to converse in the language with, who I can expand on, someone who's patient while I open up another tab and search for a word, someone who could just wait an entire 30 seconds while I'm kind of, you know, in a daze trying to think of a simple word. You, that's what you want. You want a good, patient teacher. Um, but the best way to, to find out is to test all the teachers you can. Uh, you know, you might spend $100, but then you will get the one teacher or two teachers that you know are going to help you the most, and then move forward with them and get daily lessons with that person. Awesome. So that's what I'd recommend. Great. OK, cool. So another question from David. Um, this is a good one. OK. Um, Mini mission related question. Do you have or do you suggest general general mini missions that you have when you're learning a new language? Just to keep everyone just to keep yourself like motivated, like breaking down small missions. Mm. Yeah, uh, mini missions are very important for me because I, I feel um, when you're taking on a language, if you know, for instance, when I took when I took on Chinese, one reason people say Chinese is the hardest language, is because they're looking at everything at the same time. They're saying, I have to learn the characters. I have to learn the tones. None of the words are the same. Um, you know, I, All of these things they come up with. And they, they're like, I have to deal with all of this at the same time. And that's extremely intimidating. And I would be equally intimidated if I had to do everything in a language, learn its grammar, learn all the vocab try to learn the pronunciation and whatever else uh, has in store. So both for keeping me sane and for having a sense of achievement, I really prefer many missions. So for instance, with, uh, with Chinese, I found when I started, I had my phrase book with me. And I was in Taiwan. I was going out, and I was reading things in, like just without having memorized them, just reading them direct. And people didn't understand me. And it's because it's a tonal language, and you have to have no, you don't have to have your tones perfect, but if you have most of your tones pretty good, then you can make yourself understood. So I decided for two whole weeks um, to say, do you know what? I'm not learning any characters. I'm not learning any uh, necessarily. I'm going to focus on tones. And that's what I did. For, I, I did nothing but I took online tests that would like sh uh, say a word to me and then Multiple choice is this first, second, third, third, fourth tone. Um, and I would do that. I would try to train myself to say them. And I kept going, not until I had my tones perfect, but until I had them to a certain level that it was very useful to allow conversation to flow. 
And then when I finished that, my biggest problem was um, I, you know, I could read what was in my phrase book, but I didn't have anything in my active memory. So then I started memorizing a ton of words and basic phrases. And in language learning, there are many problems we have. We can't express ourselves eloquently. We can't talk about deep things. We make lots of mistakes. There are so many problems we have. But I like to, you know, sit down, write out all your problems, and think to yourself, what is the biggest problem of all? I look at it like a triage system in a hospital, where you might have a stub toe and a gunshot wound at the same time. Which do you see to, to first? And that, that's kind of cool. The, pro the problem is a lot of people in language learning, they're like, well, obviously, I've got to see to both of them first, you know, because uh, the stub toe isn't going to go away anytime soon. And I would say, forget the stub toe, deal with the gunshot wound. And then you can um, deal with the stub toe. And it's, it's like that. And that's why, uh, you know, grammar, big problem in language learning. But it's more important that I can just say something. So I would just try to uh, memorize as many words or full phrases, but not the grammar that connects them, because that's not going to help me as much as just blurting out Tarzan speak, uh, me hungry, wear food, you know. That's, that's way more effective. So that, that's kind of the way I would think of it, to, to figure out what your mini-mission is, yeah. write down all of your problems, and, and decide realistically what is the biggest problem. And don't, 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 not something like uh, the, not, that's not defined, like uh, I can't have a conversation. Like, what, why can't you have a conversation? Then you'd see I don't have the words, and then you focus on the words. And try, try wow. to break it down to something actionable, you know, not cool. I'm dumb. That's that's not a good <laughs> <laughs> problem number one. I'm dumb. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So let's take, uh, take a question from the audience. Courtney, you got a question? Oh, I do. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually going to the country of my target language in three weeks, and. Woo. Um, yeah, woo. Uh, the only problem I have is that everyone speaks English there, so <laughs> I'm Which just worried that I'm going to Norway. I'm learning Norwegian. I was actually in Norway um, <laughs> uh, last year, uh, and um, Brian was there as well. And we actually, I was traveling around the country, and I disagree with you because I mm -hmm. went into a pharmacy with a friend of mine, and she had a cold. And she went into the pharmacy said, do you have any medicine for a cold? And they, they were like, uh, uh, put on a blanket, I guess. And they, they didn't understand <laughs> cold in that sense. So, um, you know, their, their English is very good. But I would not say they necessarily all speak English all the time. And I've actually found this is a myth in general in north of Europe. I've lived in Amsterdam and Berlin and a few places where the level of English is very high. It's much higher than in other places, so it can feel like everyone speaks English, but they don't necessarily want to all speak English. They just have a very, very good education system for languages, which mm -hmm. we can all be jealous of, of course, but the, um, the point is that they will speak English to you to be helpful. And something I found in Amsterdam, where the level of English is very, very good, um, is that if you start in, the, in Norwegian, and you know your Norwegian won't be perfect, and their English may be better. But you just start in Norwegian, and if they if they say, oh no, we can speak in English, it's okay. You you just have to stand your ground and say, I appreciate that, but I really want to practice Nor Norwegian, and they will respect you for that. So you have to kind of stand your ground a little bit because they will default. They'll hear an accent, they'll hear mistakes, they'll default to English. And you just have to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm learning Norwegian. I'm really, I want, I appreciate you speaking English, you know, you, you thank them for it. Um, and also make sure you're, you're having fun. Because one thing, I was out with some people in uh, Berlin, and their German was better than mine, but they could not convince Germans to speak German to them. My German was very choppy, and I never, ever spoke English uh, when I was in Berlin at that time. And the reason I looked at them and I could see that they were very, uh, they looked like they were in pain when they spoke. <laughs> you know, they, they, they were all like, uh, ich, uh, ich will, uh, uh. And, and when I spoke it, I was like, ich will Deutsch lernen. And, and I, like, I just looked like I was having fun. And when you look like you're struggling, when you look like you're sweating and, 
and really <laughs> frustrated about your language skills, then they, as nice people, will want to save you from that and will speak English for that reason. So I would say okay. to look like you're enjoying yourself, to have fun with it, to laugh at your own mistakes. You'll make mistakes. You won't, you know, you put verbs or whatever you'll do. You'll do those mistakes and just laugh at it. And know that it's happening. And always thank them. Thank you know. Say, look, guys, I really appreciate you uh, helping me with my Norwegian. Um, and this is, look, I like to call this the Northern European myth that they will only speak English to you. That is absolutely not true. Uh, especially once, like in city centres, they they default to English when because they're used to getting tourists in certain places. But that doesn't mean that they have to continue in English with you. You know. And on top of that. See if you can pick up on their body language and their fashion sense, because that's another really crucial th thing in my language learning. And uh, is a, I found that when I dress like a local and act like a local, they are more likely to um, to do things. Like I, an example, I always give people is when I had learned uh, Arabic, and I was in Egypt, I couldn't quite um, get them to speak Arabic with me. My, my Arabic was not great. I couldn't get them to stay in, in Arabic, and I actually, rather than think I have to go and study more Arabic, I looked at myself and I realized I really, really looked like a tourist. I had my cap on, shorts and a t-shirt, flip-flops, um, and I thought, you know, what is different about Egyptians? And I noticed that they, they tend, Egyptian men my age tend to have a thick mustache, let their uh, facial hair grow out, they, they wore like thick woolly jumpers. So I, I changed all of these little things about myself. And they didn't think I was Egyptian instantly, but they they kind of had this less of a visual, oh, this guy's a tourist, got to speak English, you know? Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind, and keep in mind in Norway, they have different rules about, like, maybe distance between people or how they might touch each other, like in, you know, some places you might put your hand on their shoulder if they're talking, facial expressions, maybe, you know, all these little things, try to pick up on that as well as just being confident and trying to use the language. And if someone speaks to you in English, just say, you know, it doesn't mean you've lost. Just say, um, you know, I appreciate you speaking in Norwegian. Say, I appreciate you speaking English, but I really want to practice my Norwegian. And they will respect that. They, they will really appreciate that you're trying to speak their language. Awesome. Great. Why don't we take one more question from the audience? Anybody? Meg? Then? You need to unmute yourself first if you have a question. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you come to land here. OK, hi. So uh, have you already had burnouts while learning? If not, uh, how did you avoid them? And if so, how did you cope with them? Yeah, I had, I had actually quite a lot of burnouts when I was learning uh, Chinese, when I was learning Mandarin. and. I reached the stage where I had studied uh, and been practicing so intensively that I actually had a whole week would go by that even though I was still studying intensively, I wasn't retaining anything. It was going in one ear at the other, and I was very stressed out, and um, it was not conductive to language learning. So ever since then, I generally, even in my most intensive projects, I take a day off every week at least a day off and during the day I'll, I have my little breaks uh, that, that help me kind of um, let off steam you know even when you're in the country I would say do you know what I'm gonna to go to the cinema and watch a cheesy Hollywood movie in English and that, that would like let me relax because um, burnout is because uh, you're working a little too hard and it's um, it's a tricky balance because you need to be working hard if you want to make a uh, very fast progress but um, I have a very strict cheat day policy. I'll take one day off a week when I'm in an intensive language project. Um, and other than that, like during the, even during the day, I would never study for like a three or four hour block. I, I use um, something I mentioned on the blog. I use the Pomodoro technique. So I'll study for 25 minute segments and take a five minute break. 25 minutes, five minute break. And do that over two hours, then take a full hour long break. Because uh, you reach, like, there, I, I see this as being two levels of burnout. There's the very short-term burnout that you've been studying for four hours straight, 
and you're just completely exhausted because of that and that, that means you need to take little breaks throughout your day and that won't happen as often and then there's the medium term one that you've been studying for three weeks straight and you can't think at all because of that and that's why a, a nice day off speaking another language um, giving yourself a break, treating yourself to whatever you want to do, a laser tag or something do anything but learn the language uh, a day or two um, uh, yeah, my, my general process in my three month missions is one day off a week and then one weekend off uh, per month. And that's helped keep, keep me uh, at a better balance. Awesome. All right, I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Vanny, for being with us and answering the questions. And um, no problem. All right, so please, if you guys want to learn more about Benny, go to fluentin3months.com. And that's it. Thanks, guys. Bye. Best of luck, everybody, in your projects. Bye-bye.